All right. Very well. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming and attend this session. We are Eric and Massimo, and we are part of the, the team responsible for the product strategy inside the management BU at Red Hat. Um, today, we are going to talk about the financials behind the private cloud, and specifically behind the private cloud based on OpenStack. Um, before showing you some numbers, I'd like to start giving you uh, some details about the background of this project. Because we started it as an internal research, so no plan to share what we were going to, to find out. And uh, we started this research to find the answer to two big questions. The first is, uh, is OpenStack more cost effective to build a private cloud if we compare it with other non-OpenStack based solutions? And the second question is, OK, convenient or not, we choose OpenStack, deployed it. OK, what are the first thing to look at? What are my uh, priorities if I want to take out the most from my private cloud? So we run through a number of TCO models that we found on the market. But to be fair, they were not good enough to provide the, the kind of detail that we were looking for. They were not transparent enough for our purpose. So we decided to build our own model. And uh, what you will see is very different from what you may be used to, because it's not the standard marketing tool uh, conceived and built just to prove a couple of points that are convenient for us as a vendor. Um, but uh, is been built, has been built as a tool first and to be consumed by IT decision makers. And we put together a tool able to provide support for financial conversation and within the company and with the line of business. And during the process of building this model, we requested a number of peer review from IT guys and financial guys across a number of companies. Basically, we followed the exact same process, the exact same methodology that the major analysis firms does to do this kind of research. Uh, to be as objective as we could, wherever we could, we relied on standard, standard market analysis data. But for those kind of numbers, for those kind of information that they are not covered by traditional uh, research, we had to do a number of assumptions. So something may be wrong, but if it is, it is just for two reasons. So or we did the wrong assumption at the beginning, or we used outdated numbers. But the good news is that the model is completely transparent, so it's very easy to fix both these two dimensions and to improve this model over time. The important thing to know is that we tried to build the most comprehensive, the, the most objective, and the most real TCO model that we could to describe a private cloud. And we built it to work as a scorecard, so to help doing comparisons using your own numbers. Long story short, the model right now is able to provide numbers to be crunched by financial guys. has been designed by, well, IT guys who know things like that employees and technologies has different cycles within the company. And because we believe that tools are the right way to find out answers, we build it to support organization and ourselves at the first time uh, into ongoing decision processes. So, as I mentioned before, we started this research as an internal activity. Absolutely no plan to share the results, but in the process of building this model, we found out a couple of remarkable things, very interesting things, so we decided to submit this session to the summit. We are very happy that it's been accepted. And I don't want to waste any more time with an introduction, and I want to go straight to what we find out. And the first thing is that good news. OpenStack is the least expensive technology on the market if you want to build a private cloud. And that's a big result, not really surprising. But because no one tried before to build a model able to describe a private cloud from a financial standpoint, we are more than happy to have numbers that can prove this point. But the real amazing thing of this result is that it's not related to a single situation. 
is not related to a bunch of use cases that we choose wisely to have this result, because more than being the least expensive technology on the market, no matter how fast you grow, no matter how slow you grow, no matter uh, the, the adoption curve that you will see, the model tells that there is no single situation where OpenStack is more expensive if we compare it with known OpenStack-based solutions. Okay, it's time to give you a little bit of background on how we achieved those results. And we started considering a number of different growth cures. Why? Because we try to understand if the results that we had from the model were consistent and unrelated to the adoption curve. And those curves are all different because describe different kind of adoption strategy that an organization may choose and how successful those strategies are. Those cures are different because are influenced by a number of external and internal factors. For example, you may see your organization going for an all-in strategy, moving all their application on a private cloud. Uh, on the opposite, you may see your organization uh, betting on a single relevant pilot project that, if successful, is able to drive a huge amount of confidence within the line of business. And because there is this independence that, that, that we saw between the result relative to competitors and the growth curve, you may see numbers that are slightly different from what you see for your organization, but the point is that the model remains valid. So, because there is this independence, and so no matter the growth cure, the result remains valid, we decided just for this specific representation to use what we think is the most common growth curve, so the exponential curve. And if you attended to uh, the keynote session, you may have heard about a number of use cases of OpenStack users that showed up numbers that support this kind of statement. So we say that the model is made to do comparison. So comparison are the way we use to answer the two questions that I explained before. And for the first question, we made a number of assumptions. The first is that uh, you need and you want to deploy a private cloud. So your choice is between OpenStack and a number of other technologies, a number of known OpenStack-based technologies. Uh, that's why, to answer the first question, so if OpenStack is the most cost-efficient, we did a comparison between OpenStack as a foundational technology for a private cloud and other technologies. To answer the second question, we did another kind of comparison, that is, uh, within the buying model that you may choose to adopt OpenStack, so basically OpenStack versus OpenStack. But what we compare actually in the model uh, we compare the three main cost items inside a private cloud. They can be divided basically in what you buy and whom you work with. So what you buy, we are talking about the software and the hardware, and whom you work with, we are talking about the people. And those three big cost items are made of a number of different dimensions. For example, for the software, we consider subscription and licensee cost, depending on the cloud software, of course. And for the people, we consider things like um, server and storage administrator, uh, networking and system engineers, we consider their managers, uh, the onboarding costs and the training, all those kind of things. For the hardware, we consider all the things that you need to buy, so server, storage, networking, and all the money that you're going to spend to renew those technology over time. What happens is that the model itself is able to address each one of these cost items over time in a different way. For example, if you, want, if you want to work on the software cost, the model compares a number of different cloud technologies to find out which is the most efficient. And if you want to address the people's cost, the model simulates the introduction of IT automation in your infrastructure. In the end, if you want to act on the hardware cost, the model simulated the increase in VM density per physical host. So 
what are we going to compare? Uh, we are not quoting explicitly any specific competitor because it's not a nice thing to do. But the matter of fact is that we all know that all the competing technologies offer a certain degree of automation and orchestration capabilities. And because we need to make an apples to apples comparison, we can't use a plain OpenStack distribution. Because we all know that OpenStack has a lot of potential for automation, but right now it doesn't really provide those kind of capabilities that the competitors have in their own um, products, in their own bundles. So what are we using here is OpenStack plus a cloud management platform able to provide those kind of capabilities. And well, because we are at that, the numbers that we put inside comes from RHCI, Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure, which offers both OpenStack and CloudForm as a, PM, as, as a CMP. Now, let me spend just a few moments on the notion of CMP. Because cloud management platform is a terminology that Gartner introduced to identify a family of products intended to uh, augment infrastructure providers such mm, hypervisors, uh, infrastructure as a service cloud managers like OpenStack itself, uh, even Platinum as a service. And the kind of capabilities that you may expect to have a CMP to provide to your infrastructure are things like mm, chargeback, orchestration, uh, service catalog, external crowd brokering, whatever. And another thing that you should expect the CMP to be able to do is to provide all those capabilities across a number of engines on premises and a number of different public cloud providers, enabling what the market now calls an hybrid cloud. So in the end, we are talking about a piece of software you may expect to have into production in the last stages, in the last maturity stages of your infrastructure. And that leads us to the point where we should remember that implementing a private cloud is a journey and it may take years to reach a certain degree of maturity or even full maturity. That's not something that we are saying, it's not something that Red Hat says, it's something that a large number of analysis firms are saying so far. Let me clarify just for a moment this, this thing. You can deploy an infrastructure as a service in, let's say, six months, uh, but you'll still need years to reach different stages of maturity. Because, for example, you will need time to align uh, the skills of your people to the new technology. You will need time to align your internal processes, your business processes to the service model. You will need time, for example, to identify and deploy a number of tools uh, able to provide new capabilities to the private cloud or to augment it, like introducing the CFP. And all those things, while you are still driving the adoption of a new infrastructure that you put in place. Uh, that's the reason why we are showing this comparison on a six years time span. That's one reason. The other reason is that we are showing uh, the cost and how this, those costs changes over time. Uh, in fact, we developed the model on a 10 years time span which is way longer than how your current implementation may look like. But we did that to be sure that there were no weird gotchas over time. So a couple of things that you may need to know to read in the proper way this comparison. The first is that because we choose to use for this specific representation the uh, exponential growth curve, you will see the number of VMs doubling year over year. And another very important thing is that the metric that is representing the cost here is a unitary metric, so it's cost per VM. This is a very relevant thing, but we have an entire section about that, so we can just go through and finish this boring long introduction and, so, and show you graphs. And on top of the graphs, numbers. Those are the numbers who actually support the two statements that we did at the beginning. And because this is a, a crucial point of this project and a crucial point of this uh, presentation, I'd like Eric to spend a few or even a lot more words <laughs> on the background yeah. of this project. Thanks, Ma Thanks Massimo. Um, one thing you can see here is looking at some of the difference in the cost. So in that first year, maybe $500 cheaper per VM. Uh, as you're further along in different maturity, that uh, increases maybe $750. Um, 
If you are looking to convince your CIO and say, great, fantastic, we have this project, this is the technology I want, one of the questions he or she is probably going to ask is, all right, so it's a little bit cheaper, is that cost going justified for the risk? So one thing to think about is, you know, you can see how that increases over time. So if we look at the aggregate costs, you know, these costs get fast because we're growing fast, uh, and you can start to see, look at, all right, well, it's still growing fast, but those curves look kind of close together. Uh, tell me more about that. So let's take a look at what we have for just that difference, that gap between. So because the non-open stack technology, even with the automation and orchestration and everything else is more expensive, the difference between those two increases over time. So we start to see really big numbers uh, popping up pretty quickly. And you have to remember that these numbers are based off that relatively slow start uh, of the exponential curve. Uh, my guess is there are probably a lot of you in the room who may even have more than we have, more VMs out there than the number that we have at the end. So if you have, you know, that means that you're reaching those uh, savings even faster. One thing, another way to think about it, though, is, is we look at the, not only the cost, but what is the total cost of running this over time? So the majority of this cost is in software costs. There's a little bit in uh, hardware, uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so the majority of this is in software cost. Um, so if you think about this um, as you get uh, different amounts of discounts from your, uh, from your different vendors. So uh, not surprisingly, our competitors did not want to give us their discount schedules. So to do uh, an apples to apples comparison, uh, these are all list prices. So if you think about it and you think about the, the, uh, the numbers that you have and discounts you get from your competitors, adjust them by your discount, it'll be pretty close to what you see. But even with those discounts, it really doesn't matter what those discounts level, levels are. Um, Pretty quickly, you can see is if you get to a, uh, a private cloud of any real size, you find that the OpenStack with a uh, cloud management platform for the automation uh, will save you millions of dollars over anything else that's out there on the market. So, so we're going to hold them to the end, but we'll keep going. Thanks, Ian. Okay, now what, what Eric just explained is basically the TCO behind the private cloud and the remarkable amount of money that you can save choosing OpenStack plus a CMP. But if you remember the second question was, okay, but there is any way for me to save even more money, there is any way uh, to increase those efficiency and get out even more from what we, uh, I have bought. And luckily the answer of the model is yes, so the, 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 the question now becomes, yes, but how? And what the model points out is that automation, introducing automation has the highest impact on cost by and far than everything else. So automation that, as we remember, impact directly on people cost is actually the first thing to look at to lower and be more efficient from a cost standpoint on your private cloud. All right, so remember we said at the beginning what uh, we're using a lot of industry data so we can be as pragmatic and practical and objective as possible. One of those pieces is the level of automation uh, and the impact it has in the number of uh, OS instances, so VMs plus physical, uh, per sysadmin. So it's an organization by the name of C Computer Economics does a lot of this kind of stuff. Uh, they do staffing ratios and other things like that. Uh, and they find that the average organization with the average amount of automation supports about 53 OS instances per admin. They also find that the average organization with a high level of automation supports almost double that at 100. And there are some really big numbers even well above and beyond that. So, you know, um, as we look at our exponential growth as an organization, you have a couple options, right? So next year, you're supporting twice the volume that you are today. Um, you really don't want to kill your admins, not only because that's impolite, but there are some other reasons as well. Um, but so you have some options. You can either double your staff, which good luck with that, uh, or you can introduce something like automation to help, you know, help that happen. So, but this is, a, you know, this is a talk on the, on the numbers and the, and the cost benefit. So, you know, the automation, in addition to making people's lives easy, 
uh, is only effective in terms of the conversation that we're having if it has an economic benefit. So in order to look at that, we looked at a number of different ways that you can purchase, consume, procure, grow your uh, own OpenStack cloud. So we looked at uh, upstream, pulling it down yourself, uh, the, a commercial distribution, and a commercial distribution with a CMP. So you, know, you're, you may be asking yourself, and I, I hope you're asking yourself, because we asked ourselves these questions, you know, uh, why do I want to pay for an expensive CMP? Uh, why do I want to use a commercial distribution? I've got a lot of really smart people. They can support the code. They can support, uh, they can support the cloud. Well, uh, what the model showed us was that s despite the additional cost of using a commercial distribution, it ended up being less expensive than using the pure upstream. And uh, it was mostly because you end up with a commercial distribution just supporting your cloud rather than supporting your cloud and the code. Right? You need more people to do that. And then with the CMP, the level of automation and orchestration and, uh, and all the things that uh, Massimo talked about earlier, uh, that high level of automation drives the number of uh, OS instances per admin even higher, reducing that cost. So despite the additional cost of the CMP uh, above either of the other options, it ends up being the least expensive as your cloud grows. So where do, what do those uh, actually look like? Uh, so this is called a, a waterfall chart. Um, you read left to right. We're starting with uh, RHEL OSP, which is our commercial distribution of uh, OpenStack. This is the loaded cost of a VM, so bringing in all those costs that we talked about before, all the hardware, the people, the software, et cetera. Um, as you read, uh, read to the right, you add in the red cost. The red makes it higher, green makes it lower. And then you get to uh, those change and get to our RHCI, which is Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure that Massimo mentioned. It's the combination of OpenStack uh, plus our CMP cloud forms. And even with that additional automation cost, so their software cost and the difference between the two is relatively small. It's about 53 bucks. But the tremendous amount of savings in the amount of additional people that you don't have to hire as your cloud grows ends up being by and far, it's huge compared to the, the, the little cost of the software. So as you're growing rapidly, you end up having to hire fewer people uh, to be able to stand with the growth. So there's a, there is an additional cost for the software. Uh, the ROI is kind of obscene if you just look at the numbers on that side. Uh, and this holds not only in early, but also in a mature cloud. So we're showing year five on the chart. So that's exactly the reason why we recently announced the acquisition of the popularity automation tool Ansible. But the question now is why Ansible and not other technologies on the market in the same segment? Well, a couple of reasons, but just to stick on the conversation we are having today, uh, probably the main reason is that Ansible is simple to use. Simple to use means that uh, if you think about the playbook, they are basically human readable. That means that you are lowering the cost for the learning. And Ansible is agentless and based on SSH. That means that you're lowering the cost to integrate the technology within the existing infrastructure. Now, if you remember the, the two comparisons, we say that we were looking at unitary costs, so VM's cost. And this is a big thing because one of the big take home of this project is that, of course, it's extremely relevant to track the total cloud cost, but the real metric to look at if you want to show how good you are into providing uh, efficiency and a good service at scale is VM's cost. Why? Very simple. VM's costs are very good to representing the ch how ch cost changes over time and uh, is a very good metric to represent how good you are into providing efficiency at scale. And finally, if you act as a service provider, even internally, the kind of numbers that it provides are closer to what your customer expects. That's another big take home here. All right, so a couple things to think about when you're talking about your, your units. So what are you, what are you uh, looking at? So one, costs are absolutely dependent on timing. Um, people come and go at different rates. Uh, hardware, you have to buy hardware for growth. You have to buy hardware for refresh cycles. Even on those refresh cycles, you have to buy more hardware for growth. Uh, and software, if it's a license and maintenance versus subscription, all these things come together, can hit at different times. So the, the lesson here in this uh, particular is if you offer the exact same service at the exact same quality, at the exact same quantity, next year your prices might not be the same as they are this year. 
So the other one is, if we take a look at the total costs, um, Massimo and I have spent a lot of time with this data. Um, we, you know, we've talked to a lot of people about it. We're thinking a lot about it. I can't tell if we're getting any better from this, right? I say, okay, fantastic. Now we're spending a lot of money. Okay, is this <laughs> great? You go. So if we look at the VM costs, we can actually tell that we're getting a lot better. Right? So that, that huge curve that we saw before just looking at the total costs, I can't see that between year one and year three, my costs per VM have been cut in half. I can't see these level of improvements. So you know, being able to figure out what your unit is that you want to measure, and I suggest taking a look at the, the VM costs, will do a significantly better job of helping you uh, go back to your organizations and say, not only are we doing great things, but it's helping us change the cost of what we provide year over year. And the implications of what Eric just explained is that you should expect your total cloud costs to increase while you are seeing your VM's costs decreasing. Why? Very simple, because the total cloud cost is a great indicator on uh, about how good you are into onboarding new people into your infrastructure. On the other side, we have the VM's cost, which is a great indicator to show how good you are into providing efficiency from a, from a cost standpoint inside your infrastructure. So there's something a little bit strange about that interaction, so not only are we showing different directions, uh, but that there's a, a direct causal fact. Lowering your VM costs will increase your usage larger than you reduce it. So you will increase your total, total costs by reducing your unit costs. So that may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but if you look at it just kind of uh, a different way, you lower the costs, People get more excited about it, more people want to use it, you grow, and the total cost is even more. So that growth in cost can be a great thing. Uh, with clouds and servers and VMs, we can actually be even a bit more prescriptive about it. So we looked at a bunch of the data from IBM, or sorry, from IDC about uh, VMs and server costs and things over the years. And what we found is that a 1% reduction in cost ends up leading to about a two and a quarter percent increase in usage, which then causes about a 1.2% increase in uh, total costs. So this has been, the numbers uh, are about that range, have been that way for, and since, give or take, 1970, well before we had, well, we had clouds. Now, we explained that uh, to lower the cost related to the software, you must choose the most efficient cloud software you can find on the market. On the other side, we explained that to act on the people's cost, you may introduce IT automation first. So what remains out? The cost of the hardware. What the model says, surprisingly, is that increasing the VM density on physical servers doesn't have this big impact on the cost. Well, we are not saying that is not a relevant amount of money, especially if you reach a certain scale. The lesson here is that if you are focusing on high impact cost items, uh, hardware is not the place where you should start. You, you can easily care less about how much you are paying for your hardware. Right. All right, so I was surprised <laughs> about <laughs> this. Uh, you know, hardware cost is a really easy one to point to, and it made you know my thinking fantastic. Hey, if we can double the number of VMs per server, then we get to buy a lot less hardware. Uh, ended up, it didn't really have a big impact. So uh, this chart, uh, as you can see, all these lines are very close together. So what we're looking at is those unit costs, those, per those VM costs per year, and we're looking at four different densities. So the most expensive is 10 VMs per server. The least expensive is the highest density at 30. So if you take a look at somewhere around a, an average density of say 15, and you double it to 30, you're talking about a savings of about $350 per VM per year. Um, and that's before all the costs of software to be able to get that, before all of your effort and staff time and everything else to be able to get all these things to happen. Now, um, don't get me wrong, every single dollar, every single yen, every single euro you can save your organization is important uh, and is a good thing, but don't start with hardware density. Uh, the, you know, the 
that $350, even before, your, um, before those uh, additional expenses and effort are coming, are significantly less than the 1000 bucks or more per VM you can get by uh, expanding and growing your capabilities in automation. Now, let me recap for a minute with what we saw today. So we saw that if you want to act on the software cost, you may want to choose the most efficient cloud software on the market. And well, you did well choosing OpenStack. But now that you have deployed it, the point is uh, I have to uh, put in place a number of recommendations to get out the most from what I bought. And those recommendations are first that you should focus on IT automation that impacts on people's cost because on, on the other side, we have VM's cost, who, which has a surprisingly low impact on the total cost. The other thing that we learned is that uh, the metric to focus on to show how good you are into providing the service is the VM's cost. The third thing that we learned is that you should expect your total cloud cost to rise while you see your VM's cloud cost to lower. And that's because a high uh, total cloud cost means that you have a lot more people using your service, which, frankly speaking, is a good problem to have. Right. <laughs> All right, so we talked about a little bit about the model and how it works and some of the results. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do in the knobs and the tweaks uh, on the model itself. Um, you know, we mentioned we made a number of assumptions. We might try to make as few as possible. We tried as much as possible to use uh, uh, data from the industry. Um, so here are, you know, here, here are some of the assumptions and data that we used, and probably a pretty good uh, general classification. Um, one thing about TCOs, so uh, I probably, I know you don't really care how much work this was to do the TCO, <laughs> but we put a lot of work into making it really good for you, right? And we, we uh, but, you know, TCOs, uh, like all the financial models, are really specific to the individual organizations. Uh, if you are a, uh, if you're an, uh, an auto manufacturer, you're going to have a different cost model than if you're a uh, retail organization. And if you're a retail organization in Tokyo, it's going to be a different cost model than a retail organization in Toledo, whether that's Spain or Ohio, right? Um, so all of these things have to be able to be, uh, be tweaked. The second piece is TCO. This is, you know, this is just cost. What we really want to get to above and beyond with this is what's the value of this stuff, right? How does this help our organizations? What is the value we are providing to our organizations? And TCO is a fundamental piece to help us get there, but we'd like to see more. So we got a question for you. Um, we're thinking about open sourcing this. We're looking for help, we're looking for ideas, and we think that if we work together, we can take the basis of what we have and actually build it into, what if we had a model to look at the value this is providing to our organizations, and you can be able to tune it to exactly your numbers, and you know, poke at our assumptions, tell us where we're wrong, and all kinds of other things that, uh, uh, that we've worked together. You know, just some ideas we tossed around that we'd love to see somebody do is, what if this is, rather than just looking at the infrastructure, what if this is looking at specific, you know, full application stacks, or, you know, per industry data, or all kinds of things. There's l lots of places this could go. Yeah. Okay, I think is all for today, at least on our side. I suspect we are a bit short on time to answer for questions. Okay. But well, we so will be more than happy. If you want to reach us any time, we'll be... More than happy to. And we'll hang out right here until we get kicked out if you have questions. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah.